As the legal teams battled it out in court, the clash between intelligent design and evolution was taking a toll on Dover. Local newspaper reporter Lori Lebo sat through every day of testimony, and the conflict began to drive a wedge between Lori and her father. He believed that God really should be in science class. He did not believe in science. And he was all worried about me and because I believed in evolution. And he said, you know, well, do you really believe that we came from monkeys? <laughs> At that point, I was, I was pretty burnt out from the trial, and I didn't really have the patience that I probably should have had with him. And I just said, yeah, I mean, you know, yeah, I do believe in evolution, Dad. And so we'd fight every morning. If you believe in heaven and hell and you believe you have to be saved, nothing else could possibly matter. Not the First Amendment, not science, not rational debate. You, all that matters is that you're going to be rejoined with the people you love most on this earth. Teaching the traditional evolutionary Darwinian concept that man evolved from lower uh, or forms of life that's almost a slap in my face. That takes the dignity away from humanity as far as I'm concerned. What gives dignity to man is that every one of us are made in the image of God. He is the creator and he created the world with intention and with design. It upsets me deeply that now in our educational system we are indoctrinating our young people to think differently about humanity. I've never made a secret of the fact that I'm a Roman Catholic, and a long tradition of scholarship in the Catholic Church has argued that truth is one, that science and religion should ultimately be in harmony. But that doesn't make faith a scientific proposition. I think, as many religious people do, that faith and reason are both gifts from God. And if God is real, then faith and reason should complement each other rather than being in conflict. Throughout the trial, Judge Jones would never tip his hand about which way he was leaning on whether intelligent design is science. But science was not the only issue before the court. The climax of the trial would be the judge's ruling on a question stemming from a different line of evidence. When they introduced intelligent design into the classroom, were members of the Dover School Board motivated by religion? If so, that would amount to a violation of part of the First Amendment to the Constitution, the Establishment Clause, which mandates the separation of church and state. In order to prevail, we needed to prove either that the school board acted for the purpose of promoting religion or that its policy has the effect of promoting religion. It's, the, it's, it's either purpose or effect, either one. The Establishment Clause says that Congress cannot pass a law which promotes uh, one religion over another. And that trickles all the way down to any state action, and in this case, the actions of a uh, school board. But what evidence was there that the school board was motivated by religion? Months before the trial, when Bertha Spar had unpacked the boxes containing the 60 copies of pandas given by an anonymous donor, she found a clue. I was directed by the administration to unpack the boxes, count the books, stamp and number them. In the bottom of the box, I found a catalog. I opened the catalog to see what they had to say about the book in question, and at the very top of the catalog page, it was listed under creation science. This should certainly be a smoking gun and would be a benefit to us somewhere down the road. This information was handed off to the National Center for Science Education. The NCSE was helping the lawyers who were arguing to keep intelligent design out of Dover High School. Knowing of pandas and people would be central to the case, Nick Motsky investigated the book. When the court case was filed and pandas was adopted in the policy, it became clear that pandas was going to be the representative of intelligent design uh, for the purposes of this case. And so the history of that book became important, the arguments it made became important, 
and we uh, undertook to dissect these various aspects in preparation for the case. Motsky dug into pandas, examining it page by page and scouring the internet to see what he could unearth about its history. Rummaging through the NCSE archives one day, Motsky came across a creationist student newspaper from 1981. At the bottom of the front page, he noticed a tiny article with a headline announcing unbiased biology textbook planned. And that article mentioned that a man named Charles Thaxton, now a fellow at the Discovery Institute, was working on a book that would present both evolution and creation. The academic editor was Charles Thaxton, who was the editor of the Pandas book. So it was clear that that ad was referring to the Pandas project. Um, what was interesting is that it talked about the book being about creation and evolution uh, instead of the later terms intelligent design and evolution. If they could show Pandas started out as a creationist book, that would suggest intelligent design is simply creationism repackaged and therefore inherently religious. Motsky emailed this information to Eric Rothschild, who immediately issued a subpoena to the publisher of Pandas for any drafts the book went through before printing. In a few months, they received two boxes of material. The lawyers sent them to Barbara Forrest, a philosophy professor and author who has been tracking intelligent design for years. She was scheduled to testify in the trial. Oh my goodness, those two boxes contained about 7,000 pieces of paper. And uh, I had to sit down with those documents and just start flipping through them, which is what I did, day and night. After much digging, she hit pay dirt. Buried in these documents were two drafts of pandas straddling the 1987 case of Edwards versus Aguilard, in which the Supreme Court ruled it unconstitutional to teach creationism in public school science class. One draft was written before the case, and the other revised just after. In the first 1987 draft, which is the pre-Edwards draft, uh, the definition of creation reads this way. Creation means that various forms of life began abruptly through the agency of an intelligent creator with their distinctive features already intact, fish with fins and scales, birds with feathers, beaks and wings, etc. The same definition in this draft, after the Edwards decision, reads this way. Intelligent design means that various forms of life began abruptly through an intelligent agency with their distinctive features already intact, fish with fins and scales, birds with feathers, beaks, etc. Same definition, just one is worded in terms of creationism, the other one worded in terms of intelligent design. Everyone said intelligent design is creationism relabeled. Never in our wildest dreams, though, did we think that this would actually be recorded in paper in a way that could be documented in a court case. And that became probably our best single piece of evidence at trial. Barbara Forrest's testimony would make a strong case that the Dover School Board was thrusting religion into the classroom. And in comparing the Of Pandas and People drafts, Forrest discovered that the authors had apparently made their revisions in haste. In cleansing this manuscript, they failed to replace every word properly. I found the word creationists. Um, and instead of replacing the entire word, they just kind of did this and got design proponents with the C in front and the ISTS in the back from the original word. So the uh, correct term for this transitional form is co-design proponentsists. And uh, everyone now refers to this as the missing link between creationism and intelligent design. You've got the direct physical evidence there of a transitional uh, fossil. Barbara Forrest's testimony not only traced the creationist lineage of pandas, citing a Christian magazine's interview, Forrest let one of the intelligent design movement's own leaders, Paul Nelson, speak for himself. The question he was asked was, is intelligent design just a critique of evolutionary theory or does it offer something more? Does it offer something that humankind needs to know? And this is his answer, quote, Easily, the biggest challenge facing the ID community is to develop a full-fledged theory of biological design. 
We don't have such a theory right now, and that's a real problem. Without a theory, it's very hard to know where to direct your research focus. Right now, we've got a bag of powerful intuitions and a handful of notions, such as irreducible complexity, but as yet, no general theory of biological design, end quote. The evidence she brought into that courtroom really exposed the hypocrisy of the intelligent design movement in a way that's irrefutable. Uh, you know, she used their own language, things that they had written and said, to show that they themselves knew that this isn't science. And on the stand, Michael Behe was asked how he would define science. Dr. Behe, using your definition, intelligent design is a scientific theory, correct? Yes. Under the same definition, astrology is a scientific theory, using your definition, correct? Using my definition, a scientific theory is a proposed explanation which focuses or, or points to observable physical data and logical inferences. There are many things throughout the history of science which we now think to be incorrect which would fit that definition. Yes, astrology is in fact one. So is the ether theory of the propagation of light and many other, uh, many other theories as well. The ether theory of light has been discarded. That is correct. But you are clear. Under your definition, the definition that sweeps in intelligent design, astrology is also a scientific theory. Yes, that's correct. You know, when you loosen the rules around what is science and uh, permit the supernatural, permit deities, um, you are really destroying what makes science so vitally important to the progress that our civilization has witnessed over the last four or five hundred years. You're going back before the scientific revolution. And, uh, you know, that's a, that's a pretty scary thing. With the scientific revolution, the work of Galileo, Newton, and others banished supernatural explanations from science. But some think the supernatural still has its place. At the very beginning of genetics, uh, the idea of there being a hereditary factor that somehow was responsible for the traits that we have, but one couldn't quite identify what the factor was, that was also initially regarded as supernatural as well. So it's not that supernaturalism hasn't been part of science. In fact, it has been, and it's often led to very fruitful results. And it seems that the evolutionists want to, in a way, uh, ignore or marginalize that very important part of the history. But Barbara Forrest testified that the intelligent design movement's goals are not entirely scientific and are spelled out in a secret Discovery Institute document that had surfaced on the Internet. Their goals are listed quite clearly in the Wedge document. It's their strategy document that they drew up about nine years ago in 1998. Their goal is to completely overthrow all of the effects of, of evolution on society, which they think are uniformly negative. Um, uh, this document states that they want to completely change American culture back to what they believe is its properly religious foundation. They want every area of life to be governed by their particular religious preferences, and they're very clear about that in this document. According to the Wedge document, Darwin portrayed humans not as moral and spiritual beings, but as animals, leading people to abandon objective moral standards. The document lays out an ambitious agenda to overthrow this legacy. To see intelligent design theory as the dominant perspective in science, and to see design theory permeate our religious, cultural, moral, and political life. Though not written by Philip Johnson, the Wedge document is an outgrowth of a broader policy he conceived called the Wedge Strategy. I know it can be made to sound like something sinister and conspiratorial, but the wedge strategy, as I've explained it, is a, a quite simple and innocent. When you use a wedge to split a log, 
You can start with the sharp edge of the wedge. My job is to be the sharp edge of the wedge, to use my academic credentials and legal abilities to get some hearing for the uh, proposition that there really is something fundamentally wrong with the Darwinian story. But I can't answer all the questions that arise. And so we need other people to form the thick edge of the wedge to take on the questions that do require a scientific expertise. With Michael Behe and others forming the wide end of the wedge, Johnson hopes the wedge strategy will overturn what he sees as the negative effects of a century and a half of Darwin's theory. The Darwinian story, when it became accepted, had a huge cultural impact. And if that story were discredited, then the cultural impact would be reversed, and there would be cultural changes in the other direction as well.